What's up, peep? I thought I would, uh, in preparation for the round two versus Phil Hellmuth, go over some of the more interesting hands. You know, we did a video already where we sort of talked a little bit about, um, you know, how Phil plays in these three bet situations, and I'm getting upset about some hands that were pretty, you know, normal uh, in, or standard, if you will. So I'm going to go up over some more that were a little more intricate. Um, some he, some of the hands he won, some of the hands that I won. And this first hand we're going to take a look at. We're going to look at a hand where I had the Jack-10 of hearts. Now, in this case, I'm sitting on 92,000, okay? He's sitting on 8,000, okay? So we're in pretty good shape at this point, 92 to 8. The blinds are 250, 500, which gives him like 16 big blinds, you know, just enough to maneuver a little bit. So I go ahead and min-raise at this point because when, you know, a player short-stacked, I'm going to go from 2.5x probably down to 2, especially, you know, under 20 big blinds. So I go ahead and make it 1,000 with the jack-10 of hearts on the button. And he defends with 10-4 clubs. So far, nothing to see here. You know, all is pretty normal. Now the flop comes. Queen, 5-4, rainbow. Okay? Um, on this flop, you know, after Phil checks, I should bet this flop a decent amount of the time. You need to have a betting range and a checking range. Sometimes I'll be checking a queen. Rarely I'll be checking two pair or better. Um, and I'll also be checking back some ace high hands and some air as well. But I will also um, mix in some, you know, C-bet bluffs. And I randomize that, you know, in various ways. So in this case, with the jack-10 of hearts, I sort of, you know, whiff the flop, but there are some backdoor potential with uh, the 10 jack queen and the three hearts. I elect to check it back. Now the turn card comes, the ace of spades, and Phil bets 1,000. So he's betting half pot, right? So here with jack high, I could just fold, right? Um, but in theory, um, it feels like a spot where I can float, if you will, with the intention of if he checks the river, betting so that I can get him off of whatever hand he has. And the reason I can do that against Phil, it's a little bit exploitative, is because Phil, on the turn, bets the wrong part of his range quite often. He bets the middle part of his range, as you can see here, betting a four, betting a five, right? That's not typically something you see, especially when an ace rolls off. Sure, he could have an ace, um, probably, I mean, he could have a queen. That's the thing. Like his, his value bet range here is kind of weak because he's betting far too often. Okay. So against him, when I call here on the turn, you know, he has to look at my range and think, all right, well, what, what do I have? I checked back the flop and now I've called the turn. So that's pretty ace heavy. You know, I have a decent amount of pairs. There's not a ton of draws, like most draws, you know, bet this flop. Maybe I have a backdoor flush draw, which is, you know, one possibility. But I like to call again with the intention of, if he checks the river, stealing this pot. And the river card comes the eight of diamonds. So no help, but it does complete some hands. It hits the six, seven, right? So six, seven is one possibility. Of course, sure. I am betting this flop with six, seven, uh, a decent chunk of the time, but not hundred um, percent. It also, you know, against his hand, I mean, just a random eight, there's a whole bunch of cards that, you know, hands that he loses to now. So he checks the river, as I was hoping for, and with 4,000 in the pot, I elect to go for half pot, and Phil is only sitting on 6,000, so me betting 2,000 is a third of his stack, uh, pretty significant, and Phil elects to call me with the 10-4. Now, you might say, wow, white magic, right? And, you know, maybe it was white magic. Maybe he had a read in this case, because in theory, when you're in this spot and you're sitting on 10-4, first thing you should be thinking about is, all right, what is the pot bet size? Uh, half pot. So then you do pot divided by bet plus pot. So that's one third. Okay. So one third represents the percentage that you should fold, you know, at a frequency, if you're thinking like game theory, right? So, uh, you know, to break even, you need to defend 67% of your range that gets here. Okay. Uh, Two thirds of the time. Now the question is, does this hand rank in the top 67% of your range? Doubt it. Because when you factor in every ace, every queen, an eight, a five, there's a whole bunch of hands that you could, you know, theoretically defend here with that fall into that 67%. And 10-4 probably isn't one of them. Um, you know, the 10 blocker, the question is like, does that block much? It does kind of block, you know, king 10, 10 jack a little bit. Um, but it's not the worst card in the world to have. Uh, so Phil makes the call, I think, for the most part, you know, I don't think it was white magic. I think it was flat out steam. Because when he gets steam, he gets sticky, right? So, you know, as it turns out, my plan, you know, I, I played the hand exactly as I planned to. He happened to make the call. Obviously, if you're playing armchair quarterback, if I would have went all in on the river, he probably folds. But that doesn't make it necessarily the optimal play in this situation. Although, you know, you could make a very, very good case for that.
Okay, so for this next hand, uh, chip stack start with I have 56,000, Phil Helmuth has 44,000, the blinds are 500, 1,000, so I have 56 big blinds to his 44. Um, I go ahead and min raise here with, to, with the king five of hearts on the button, and uh, he decides to call with the 10 8 uh, off suit. Totally pretty, you know, standard here. You're never going to fold 10 8 to a min raise, and you're, you should be, you know, coming in with a raise with king five of hearts unless you're, you know, trying to use a limping strategy of some sort. Now the flop comes king eight jack, or sorry, king jack eight, um, with no backdoor hearts for me. He uh, decides to check, and some of the time when you're seabetting, betting you need to have a mix, right? You don't just always seabet bet when you have top pairs. Some of the time you're going to check back some top pairs, set some traps, and that what that does is it protects your checking range. Because if you played so simply where you always bet your top pairs in the flop, when you check the flop, your opponent can apply pressure on the turn in the river and knock you off the hand because you can't have that much, right? So it's important to have some hands in your check back range on the flop. I like to check back with this king. Seems like a good spot to do it. Uh, the turn card is the queen of hearts, which now puts, you know, a three card straight out there and a whole bunch of other stuff. And now with 4,000 in the pot, Phil decides to bet 1,500, okay? So my hand is just a pure call, really. You know, like, like, why don't you raise to protect your hand or whatever? It's kind of a wet board. There's really not a lot of reason you'd want to raise here. You know, if he's bluffing, he's just going to fold. I'm sure, you could make an argument that you want to deny equity against a draw, but it's too weak of a hand to raise the turn with. You have just a really good calling candidate, okay? And the river card for us comes really bad. It's a 10, okay? Now the board is 10 jack, queen, king. Phil goes ahead and bets small again. He bets Now he bets 1,500 into uh, what would be 7,000. So very small bet, which means, you know, I should be defending a very high percentage of the time, right? Three out of 14, I can do the math, but whatever. Um, I didn't need to against Phil because I know in this case, um, this is either going to be a blocker bet with a hand that likely beats mine. I don't think he's doing this with a queen or a jack or something like that. Um, Maybe some two pairs, but, you know, he could have a nine and an ace. Bottom line is the way that I played my hand, I'm pretty, even though I had a really good hand on the flop, by the river, uh, the hand in terms of my range and where it ranks is quite low, right? Because I could have an ace, I could have a nine, I could have two pair, I could have, you know, a better king. There's a whole bunch of hands that I can have that I can, you know, profitably call with that a king makes for quite an easy fold, especially when you consider my opponent who is going to take this line very rarely as a bluff um, for that sizing. Okay, in this next hand, we were dead even in chips. We both had 50,000, which represents 50 big blinds. Phil goes ahead and does his limpy dimpy thing. Um, I got I go ahead and make it three thousand with the king nine of diamonds. Now what I was using against his limps was typically, and I didn't get a lot of seven x uh, situations arise, but I've, I was randomizing between raising his limps to three x or seven. I only got one seven in, and it happened to be seven deuce of spades, uh, goofy hand. But uh, in this case, I decide to raise with the king nine of diamonds, and he calls in position with the nine six of hearts. Now the flop comes good for me. Flop, uh, there's with with uh, 6,000 in the pot. The flop is king, 10, queen, two hearts. I have top pair with a straight draw. I elect to bet quarter pot. I'm going to do that with a pretty big part of my range, including bluffs, including hands like ace four suited, you know, and just air balls and stuff like that too. So um, a king is certainly a hand I can do that with. You know, you could, th- in theory, you could probably bet slightly bigger in this case against the normal opponent who limps because they're not supposed to smash this flop. But we're talking about Phil Helmuth here, right? So Phil Helmuth limp calls with uh, sort of a strange part of his range, right? Like he could have ace jack. You know, most players that have a limping strategy are not, you know, limping ace jack. They're not limp calling ace jack. They might be limp, you know, re-raising or something like that. So against Phil, um, in these spots, you can actually check more or you can bet smaller as uh, an exploit against him. So I go ahead and bet 1,500. He calls. Turn card is a six of spades. Now we're talking about 9,000 in the pot. I, uh, I like to go for 5,000. You know, I was, I was trying to hit around 60, sub, you know, 60, 65% of the pot, something in that neighborhood um, with my top pair, you know, charging any sort of draws and really kind of targeting a queen or even a 10 because Phil's going to call me with a queen and a 10 here a high percentage of the time as played. He does call. Now the river card comes, the three of hearts. And I'll be honest with you, like I really didn't notice that it was a heart, but it had no impact on the hand because I would have bet anyway. I mean, the only impact it had was he sucked out on me. Um, so I go ahead and bet 6,000, which when you consider the pot size, there's 19 in there. So I'm betting pretty small, you know, it's kind of a blocker bet. And I think this is a good candidate to do that with. And Phil goes ahead and raises the 17,500 and I quickly throw my hand away because 
in these spots, when you have a king, you have a bluff catcher, right? So Phil Helmuth is either bluffing or he can beat a king. He's not raising you on the river with any hand that falls in the middle of that category, right? So it's either a bluff or, a, or, or a, you know, a value. And the question is, what bluffs does Phil have here? Really, you know, when you think of the combinations of value, all flushes, right? So let's say there's uh, 45 combinations of flushes, you know, different combos of two hearts in his hand that he could have. Um, what bluffs do you find here? Is Phil going to be the type of guy that turns like Jack seven offsuit with the Jack of hearts or something as a, into a bluff or, you know, something like that? Not typically and not for that size and not in this situation. So it makes for um, an easy fold against Phil, but a much more difficult spot against someone like, you know, who's much more aggressive in these spots, who may actually, you know, have a hand like, you know, 10 jack with the jack of hearts and decide this is a good card to, to bluff with, which, you know, it would be, you know, it could be a spot where you turn the 10 into a bluff here and it would work. But again, as I said, with the way that Phil Helmuth plays in these spots, his aggression factor on these rivers is quite low. So he's not bluff raising here just often enough. So we make the fold quite easily. And of course, Phil hit the flush. Okay, so on this next hand, once again, we have Phil Helmuth now in the lead. Oh, my God. 64 to 36. The blind's 500 to 1,000. So I'm sitting on 36 big blinds. Uh, he goes ahead and limps, which was kind of his thing. And I pick up the ace-10. And sometimes I'm going to check back with this one, but I'm going to raise probably the majority of the time. And I go ahead and make it 3,000, and Phil calls. And Phil really butchers this hand quite badly. And I know he's worried, you know, and he, he has the same issue that a lot of, uh, you know, beginning players have in this case of, like, protecting your hand. Because the flop comes down ace, eight, seven, all diamonds. So that's a good flop for me, right? I mean, I've got aces with a 10 kicker. I don't have a diamond, which would be nice to have. But uh, I decide, um, as I will do with a pretty good part of my range here, I'm going to bet quarter pot, and I bet 1,500. And Phil elects to just go all in, massively overbetting the pot, right? So now you now it's time to dissect his range, and it doesn't take very, very long, right? Well, what hands would do this? We really shouldn't be doing this with the nuts very often. He really shouldn't be doing this with flushes. He really shouldn't be doing this at all, frankly. Like, it's not really a spot where you want to just jam. You know, you should flat. Maybe you can, you know, work in some small raises, but a jam is just way overkill. So I, uh, I have pretty much an easy lay down here despite having a strong hand simply because Phil isn't the type of player to have here, like, say, 9-10 with the 10 of diamonds, right? If he did, here's the issue, right? We make this call, our best-case scenario is that we're fading 15 outs twice. So we're an underdog anyway, right? That's our best case scenario, that he just has like some sort of pair in the king of diamonds or, you know, open and straight, flush draw type stuff like that. So the the bluffing part of his range likely may have, well, in a lot of cases, going to have better than 50% equity anyway, right? But when he has us beat, we are just dead. So we make the fold. Phil misses out on an opportunity to win some chips because had he just flatted, you know, here's the thing. His mindset is he's afraid to see a diamond come off. He's trying to protect his hand. All these things that, you know, actually like a lot of beginning players or, you know, fear-based players, uh, a mistake they make because they're not thinking about what's the like best equitable situation. They're just thinking about what gives me the best chance to win this pot right now, right? So they're minimizing value like he did in this case where he won the absolute minimum uh, after my quarter flop C-bet. He just jams, right? Again, if he calls, if he would have made it 5,000, 4,500, I can't fold to any of those. I can't fold, right? On the turn, if, if he just does call on the turn, I might bet again, right? If the turn is the deuce of clubs, I'm probably going to bet. And if not, I'm going to check call for sure. But as played, Phil doesn't understand that his range is not going to be balanced here. He's not going to have enough pure bluffs to make it possible for me to you know, correctly call with ace-10. Because as we pointed out, when he's bluffing, He's going to have probably 50% equity anyway in a lot of cases. All right, this next hand, we see another hand where Phil Helmuth does his thing. Phil raises this time, right? And he does not typically raise. He's not a raiser guy, but he makes it, I think the blinds are 6 and 1,200 here. He makes it 3,200. So recent, decent size raise. And I have a hand, king four hearts, which against a normal human being is like a slam dunk and sometimes a three bet. But against Phil, you know, like you're like, it's certainly too good to fold. But, uh, you know, you're going to, uh, you know, you're going to proceed with, caution to, to a certain degree. So I, of course, call the bet, which is standard. Now the flop comes king, jack, six, no backdoor hearts for us. I check and he bets 5,400. On a board like this, um, you generally don't want to see bet that size. He's betting 5,400 into 6,400. I mean, you can in theory, um, but if you are going to be doing this, you have to be balanced. I don't think he is in this spot um, at all. So um, 
it makes for a touchy, touchy situation where I actually considered, oh boy, I mean, as I called this flop bet, which I can't fold in the flop, I was like, if he bets the turn, I'm just folding because it's very difficult to give him a range that is draw heavy here that would play, uh, play it in such a way based on what I know about his tendency. So I go ahead and call. Now the turn card is the deuce of spades. So there's, you know, two flush draws available now. Um, I, of course, check, and he bets 19,000 into 17,000, all right? And we just, I started the hand with, you know, 46,000. We've put in three, five, eight. So you're betting like more than half my stack, right? So you're basically letting me off the hook with every jack. You know, I can't, in theory, fold a king. We just can't do that. But you can against Phil because he's not going to balance this sizing uh, adequately, right? He's going to just be far too value heavy. Sure. Some of the times you're going to get bluffed, which is, which such is life. But, uh, again, I went in with the knowledge that, uh, you know, he hasn't spent much time in the lab in terms of balancing sizes and stuff like that. So, uh, it, combining the flop size, which was too big and the turn size, which is too big, it just lends itself to value. So, um, I did make the fold and he had me completely dead if he would have played the hand like a normal person. All right, in this next hand, the blinds are 600, 1,200. I'm sitting on 35,000. Our boy Philly uh, on the comeback up to 65,000. Pick up the king deuce of clubs on the button. Going to go ahead and min-raise at this stack depth, and he calls with the queen 10. Now the flop comes, jack of clubs, six of clubs, eight of spades. So a pretty good flop for us. We've got the king high flush draw. King high is going to be the best hand a decent amount of time, plus we have, you know, the flush draw as well. For him, it's a decent flop too. He's got the 10 of clubs for backdoor potential, and he's got a gut shot. So Phil checks, and I decide to bet 1,800 into 4,800. Okay, that's a a flop where um, you don't, you can actually up your sizes if you're in position against the normal player uh, a little bit. And with the hand that I have, I'm very comfortable with uh, that sizing being correct. And Phil does what he's supposed to, and he just check calls. Now the turn card is the king of hearts. Phil checks, and with about 9,000 in the pot at this point, um, you can actually bet full pot here, or you, you know, you can bet, you can actually bet one and a half times pot. You can bet pot. You can go smaller and go for half pot. I like to go smaller because I feel like I've got a hurt locker on the hand where, um, I really want, I basically want him to continue, right? Cause I've got Kings and the flush draw. If he does have a weaker draw, this is a really good situation for us to get some chips in. And the concern is he'll fold to a pot size bet here. So we go for the half size, um, in order to target a lot of the hands that we really want to keep in there. If he does say, for example, have a worse flush draw, you know, we could just get it all in on the river. So he elects to call picking up now the open-ended straight draw. The river is the nine of hearts and Phil checks. And now I have a clear value bet. I've got top pair after that flop. It doesn't look like there's any issues, but the nine sort of slides into a lot of stuff, right? And we know here, if Phil does make two pair on the river, he's going to check. Okay. So now you have to balance two things. Number one, what is his calling range going to look like, right? He's probably going to fold a six, an eight. He calls us with a jack a decent amount of the time. Um, but he's also going to have already or have made two pair in this river as well as some straights, which we know, uh, you know, he would peel the flop with, potentially turn open-ended and hit, which he did. So it was a little bit of a thin value bet spot despite, you know, the player I was up against. So I elected in this situation because of my stack size to check it back, and I'm glad that I did because Phil turned over the backdoor gut shot, boom, boom, smack it open-ended, blah, 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 straight. And I missed my flush and it was like pretty, pretty ugly as you can see. Okay. This hand, very controversial. And we went, went to the numbers to make sure we checked and got this right. Um, Phil starts the hand with 89,000. I start with 11,000 in chips and the blinds are 800, 1600. Okay. So Phil limps with the queen eight. I decide to check back with the jack 10. It's fine to move all in here. Now, um, a lot of people didn't understand what I was doing short. I was taking in a very exploitative strategy, knowing that his tendencies in these spots is to play pretty passive pre-flop. So I could take more flops with them and felt like I had a much bigger advantage post-flop where I could, uh, you know, just throw some jabs and, uh, not take as high risks, you know, you know, on, on route to the comeback. Uh, but you can move all in here. It's fine to do that with Jack 10 against the limp. I checked back now the flop is king, 10, deuce. So we flop a decent hand. Probably there's two hearts. We're probably going with this one almost for sure. You would consider, you would think. Um, we check, Phil bets 2,100. So we elect to call um, here. And now the turn is the nine of diamonds. 
I check Phil bets all in and I'm sitting on about five and a half big blinds. So I'm getting close to two to one here, right? So in a normal situation in a vacuum, this is just a slam dunk always call, right? And when I first, you know, looked at the hand and people were talking about it, I thought, wow, you know, like I, I thought I, I thought I miscounted my chips, but I actually didn't. I, I had, um, five and a half big blinds, which I felt like against his range here, um, the mistake I make here by folding, cause it is a mistake is not factoring in some of the times where he, cause again, part of his range that he bets on the turn is incorrect. So some of the time he's just going to have a 10 here with like a worse kicker. Like he might have 10, eight or, you know, 10, seven or something like that and go all in thinking he has the best hand and is protecting and just wants to get it over with. So 10 Jack is probably too good to call because even if my opponent does have a King, I could catch, you know, I could catch the straight, I could catch the two pair and all those kind of things. So that was a case where we made a mistake uh, in hindsight. And it's something that I'll look to in the future as far as uh, in the second match about when he's short and when I'm short, not going so far with the exploits because, uh, yeah, I pushed the envelope there, but uh, I didn't expect to ever be in these spots because I thought it was just going to be like a cakewalk as it was. And I'm hopeful that in the second match, it is a cakewalk and we'll do some more hand reviews, of course, after that match where we're uh, victorious. The question is, if and when we win, will our boy Phil Helmley challenge me to a third? Because he didn't sound like he wanted to on the last podcast. He was like, well, can we make an agreement where whoever wins this one, it's over? I'm like, God, no. Why would I ever agree to that? I'd rather agree to a 10, you know, 10 match, 10 matches rather than like minimize. So tune in May 5th, 5 p.m. on Poker Go. Poker Go.